You know, there's a lot of clergy in Britain that are starting to speak out about the changes to the coronation oath that King Charles III will be anointed to. And this is coming up May 6th. So what is going to happen with this oath? You cannot have the gospel of Jesus Christ and combine it with other gods, other religions that have pagan gods. It's one or the other. If you forsake the one true way, you've given yourself over to the other side. And you cannot worship but the one true living God who came in the flesh to dwell amongst men to reverse the curse of Adam and Eve in the place of the Garden of Eden in Jerusalem. The coronation oath taken by the king or queen of England is a covenant between God and the monarchy that they believe that God put them in place as the monarch. So you have to remember what is going to happen when this king gets power he's going to be able to do anything that he wants because during the coronation he faces his subjects who are underneath his reign and whatever the king says or puts in place the people have to abide by it according to the way that the monarchy works and so I see this as happening in Israel and this king will put his laws and other implemented plans in place and the people will have no say. Now there was a video that was going viral all over the place of some of the ultra-Orthodox Jews walking down a corridor in the old city of Jerusalem, they passed by two nuns. There was one man on one side of the street in a hoodie and another man on the other side of the street. But as these ultra-Orthodox passed by these two nuns, one of the ultra-Orthodox turned and spit. And it was right towards the back of the nun. She was standing with her back in the alley there, talking to another nun who was facing her. Um, later on, it was said that it was provoked that somebody, you know, said something about ancient chant for Hitler. However, I didn't see anybody's arm go up. I didn't see that. What I saw was him spitting at a nun. And this is not uncommon. Um, they don't want to have the gospel message of Jesus there. So it makes sense that this is something that they would do. Now, there were some Jewish people speaking out about this disgusting behavior, and I think they were in the right to speak out against it. But let me tell you something about the integration into the EU would betray the coronation oath. And this is written by Clifford Denton, explains how closer integration with Europe would threaten this voluntary covenant with God. So, you know, we know we have the covenant with many, and I was just talking about how I believe it could very well be the red heifer sacrifice that this king, who will be the anointed one, otherwise known as the Messiah, will be allowed to perform, which starts the third temple sacrifice is officially beginning again. So it says a pivotal point in the debate about Britain's relationship with the EU must be our coronation oath, which sets us apart as a nation of declared intention, seeking to live under the rule and protection of Almighty God. With the Bible at the foundation of our laws, setting a protecting boundary for the free and open proclamation of the gospel in our nation with thousands of years of history to get us to June 2nd, 1953, the Queen led the way in commitment at the coronation service in Westminster Abbey. 
Britain has long been betraying this corporate oath with law changes that depart from the ways of the Bible. We also believe that the oath has been compromised by each successive closer merger with the EU, which has no such constitution as ours, being secular and humanistic at its heart. We reproduce below with minor editing to bring it up to date an article on this topic that was published in Prophecy Today in 1989. It says the coronation oath, understanding God's word for Europe. Is it a fanciful view of Britain's status before God to see it in covenant terms? God alone knows if that is how he sees his long-standing relationship with us. Nevertheless, so strong was our view of what the coronation oath meant that we used the following strap line for the article. Britain has entered into a voluntary covenant with God through the coronation oath. So this could also be the king's covenant with many. However, I do believe that there's going to be a blood covenant involved that he's going to participate in that begins the building of the third temple and the sacrificial system again. But it says, Clifford Denton explains how closer integration with Europe would threaten this unique status. This is what we published back then. Did we foresee something of immense importance that was not being headed at the time and that has even greater relevance now? What makes Britain special? We also asked, have we really been a nation that has been blessed and used by God? We went on to explore these questions and we would do well to consider them again today in relation to the EU referendum. A key to understanding the answers to these questions is in the coronation oath. This oath presents a voluntary covenant with God and attempts to offer God a framework through which he can help us to manage our affairs according to the teaching of the Bible. This is not the covenant that God made with Israel. No nation can replace Israel as a covenant nation. But Britain has probably done more than any other Gentile nation to live in a covenant relationship with God. Surely God has helped, blessed, and protected us over the centuries despite our gross imperfections because of this. Strangely, while this oath should be a central issue to consider in our decisions relating to Europe, it's hardly being discussed at all. Most decisions relating to national sovereignty are concerned with self-government rather than the government of God. Yet an alliance with the powers of Europe on financial and political grounds represents a betrayal of the coronation oath and a betrayal of God himself, for there is no similar covenant within the constitution of Europe. A historical background is the Reformation of the 16th century freed Britain of papal control. But the reign of James II, beginning in 1685, threatened to undermine the Protestant framework being formed in British institutions. James' commitment to Catholicism was resisted by some prominent national leaders, and this finally led to an invitation for William of Orange to come to Britain in 1688 and redress the nation's grievances. James fled to France, and this was interpreted as an abdication, whereupon a new parliament was formed and William and Mary, James's Protestant daughter, were offered the crown. This bloodless revolution was called the Glorious Revolution and became the means by which a more secure Protestant government could be established in Britain in the framework of, as far as a Gentile nation can go, a voluntary covenant with God. The Bill of Rights of 1689 ensured that no future monarch could be Roman Catholic and ensured that the monarch would not have unconditional powers. The government of Britain was put in the form of a contract between the monarch and the people through representation in Parliament. 
the coronation oath made law in 1688 and taken first in the coronation of 1689 was in the form of a vow made before God to govern Britain according to God's laws and in accord with the true profession of the gospel. The coronation of every monarch ever since has been a Protestant Christian service centered on this oath. The promises made by the monarch are contained in the following words according to the law. The archbishop or bishop shall say, Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of this kingdom of England and the dominions thereto belonging according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on and the laws and customs of the same? The king and queen shall say, I solemnly promise so to do. Archbishop or bishop will say, Will you to your power cause law, injustice, and mercy to be executed in all your judgments? King and Queen, I will. Archbishop or Bishop, will you to the utmost of your power maintain the laws of God, the true profession of the gospel, and the Protestant religion established by law, and will you preserve unto the bishops and clergy of this realm and to the churches committed to their charge all such rights and privileges as by law do or shall appertain unto them or any of them. King and Queen say, All this I promise to do. After this the King and Queen, laying his or her hand upon the Holy Gospels, shall say, The things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. And then the King and Queen shall kiss the book, the Gospel. These words are taken directly from the Coronation Oath Act of 1688. The monarch cannot be crowned until and unless these promises are made. Queen Elizabeth II The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on June 2, 1953 was a solemn occasion. The young queen went through the Christian ceremony with full conviction of what she was doing before God. Many of us were children then, and there was not the same ease of media communication as there is today, though the use of television was growing quite fast. Thus many of us did not see beyond the royal splendor of the day to the heart of what was going on, but the queen made her promises before God, was anointed with oil for the Holy Spirit to come upon her, took communion, and was then crowned. The record of this has been kept in heaven as well as the BBC. We are in a covenant with one another and with God because of this. This is true for all people in Great Britain. Affirming the promise. For example, every member of Parliament makes an oath or affirmation of allegiance to the monarch. The wording of the oath is... I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. This promise is the counterpart to the Queen's oath, so that she and the government together can seek a way of establishing God's rule within the nation, or God being the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and no foreign God or New Age idol. Similarly, every time the national anthem is sung, there is a reflection of the people's allegiance to the Queen, and all that the coronation oath is intended to convey, and whenever allegiance to the queen is promised, as for example in the promises of scouts and guides, acceptance of the coronation oath is implied. How many fans at our great sporting events realize that when they sing the national anthem they are praying a prayer to God? God knows what is intended, even if the words have become empty to most of our nation. So the British nation has established a framework of government which binds together monarchy, government, and state church, also drawing in the allegiance of the people which reflects what we are calling a voluntary covenant with the living God. Even though we have had this framework, we have not 
been a perfect nation by any means, yet surely by the grace of God we have been a protected nation for many years. The grace of God is always beyond the bounds of our deserving. We have done a little, and He has done much. He took us through world wars, helped us become a prosperous nation, and gave us opportunity to reflect His ways to the world through our educational, governmental, financial, and social systems, as well as through the church, which was once strong and which has known God's true revivals. Fall from Grace God's protection has not gone completely, but surely we are on the brink of disaster. In one generation we have turned away from the absolutes of biblical truth and law and entered an age of relative morality. Our law structure once reflected God's laws as they were understood from the Bible. Thanks to the dedicated and faithful work of many national leaders over the years, but now our nation is reaping what it has sown through the liberating of laws, pornography, adultery, greed, injustice, violence, abortion, degrading sexual practices, divorce, and every form of sin is rising, to which in recent days we can now add the redefinition of marriage away from God's order. Contrasting the coronation oath with European rule. In addition, we are now at a decision point regarding deeper alliance with the EU. The coronation oath represents a framework of government that is open to God's ways and to his direct help. Europe has no such framework of government. Many people suspect that the religious powers all over Europe will eventually be drawn into the alliance, becoming part of a humanistic economic and political system which will reflect a seductive and anti-Christian, which is anti-Christ, religious and spiritual power. Whether this is true or not, we must either change the coronation oath or betray it in order to make firm alliance with the powers governing Europe in our present day. Even though the oath was made in 1953, all that it represents is still in full force today. Surely God is more aware of this than we are. Thus, as far as all of our unrighteousness is concerned, speaking of Britain, the time of judgment draws near. As far as Europe is concerned, we must attune ourselves to God's perspective on this key issue before we risk betraying he who has protected us through the years. The coronation oath belongs to the fabric of our national life. We are all involved. We must consider together just what we have offered to God through the institution of monarch, church, and state. But when it comes to the breaking of the oath, who is responsible? This is a more complex question than we might think. It is not just the monarch, it is also the government, along with all who elected the government. It is also the church, and the Anglican church is speaking out against this upcoming change of the coronation oath in King Charles III's coronation ceremony where he's embracing all these other faiths uh, that have all these other gods. So this would be turning away from God and it's an apostasy, a great apostasy, if it happens. And I believe it will. It is also the church standing by while our oaths to God are betrayed in the reversal of godly laws and false alliances with other powers. Surely the queen should also lead the nation into repentance and the church should rise up as the conscience of the nation. When considered in these terms, it seems almost impossible to achieve a reversal of our decline, yet surely we know that with God all things are possible and we have a responsibility to respond at this crucial time in the nation. The fact that God has prevented Britain as an individual nation with its own governmental systems for so many centuries 
should be a prompt for us to reconsider any deepening alliance with Europe. We should reconsider what the coordination oath represents so that we might preserve and develop our heritage before it is too late. When the bottom line is drawn, it is neither the monarchy nor Europe that is the first consideration. It is the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel that matter. And these are about to be betrayed in the upcoming coronation ceremony. If he declares that he's going to be representative of all faiths. The coronation oath has been the vehicle for their preservation whereby within a framework of godly laws there has been a freedom and protection for the true gospel to go forth across the nation. This is what God has blessed and this is what we are about to give up for financial gain and political advantage within the framework of an ungodly and humanistic empire that is developing in Europe. We believe that the spiritual powers behind the EU will attack every aspect of our godly heritage, including the British monarchy, to bring it down so that the coronation oath will fall with it. Those who understand these things from a spiritual as well as a practical perspective must stand together because our spiritual adversary has already many people in high places who will use powers of finance, media, and politics to drive us into Europe in betrayal of our promises to God. The flattering promises of electioneers who emphasize allegiance with Europe will reflect this too. We can expect the powers at work to be both humanistic and seductive. And of course, King Charles III has been one of the top key speakers of the WEF and the climate change agenda, the green agenda that he wants to put through. The above article was written when the debate was whether the UK should abolish the pound and adopt the euro. The argument remains fresh for this new debate as to whether we should remain in the EU or leave, an opportunity that was barely plausible in 1989. And of course they did leave the EU in Brexit. But this week during which has been the anniversary of the Queen's coronation oath, let us prayerfully weigh these things. Should we, despite all else, realize that this opportunity to leave the EU once and for all, though brought about by men, has been given us through the gracious working of Almighty God? So, if King Charles takes this covenant, this voluntary covenant with God and the people, before God, and he changes that oath, then it is going to be a catastrophic thing that's going to bring about the system that we know is the end time system of the beast and a beast according to the prophet Daniel a beast is a king so this is the kingdom under this king that is coming about and just letting you know that the coronation oath and the holy anointing is a covenant with God and with the people that are under this king that will be his subjects. And the subjects during the coronation ceremony have to pledge allegiance to the king. I see that this is what will happen in Israel when they reestablish the king on the throne of David, the last earthly king that they will accept, and Jesus will come at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and put an end to the kingdoms of this world, and he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. So when that happens with that monarchy, especially if it's an absolute monarchy, then the king can implement and change the laws that he wants to change and implement the plans, and especially the anti-gospel plans of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people that recently, once again, wanted that law passed that would remove the gospel from Jerusalem, and you couldn't even speak the name Jesus or Yeshua online, on your channel, 
or to your neighbor. So they want to monitor people and, you know, keep them in line according with forcing even other Jews to pray only the way that they pray. And they are, um, you know, against the women having the Torah and everything else I mentioned in my other videos. They don't even want women to drive anymore. And if all these laws are put back into place, it will take people back in time to the way that it was 2,000 years ago. Um, they have spit on women in Israel before. If you have a tank top on, a sleeveless shirt, or a sleeveless dress, if your shoulders are showing, they will spit and spit on the women. So this is something that you know, we really need to take into consideration that this oath at the coronation ceremony is a covenant with God voluntarily. And turning away from being the defender of merely the gospel as the one source of the true religion of the God of Israel will be a huge great apostasy and then anybody that's following that whole system of all the combined religions that are going to wind up in mystery Babylon the great which is Jerusalem then that's going to be at the Sanhedrin building and it's going to get worse there in Israel so there are Jews speaking out about these behaviors that are disgusting and they're beginning to see the light if they didn't already. So we're going to have to be praying for the Jewish people that are going to be subjected to this king and praying for Britain to be protected from the hands of whatever this king is going to implement. If he betrays the gospel and betrays the Church of England and the Church of Scotland, and incorporates all these other beliefs, then he has not kept the oath that his mother wholeheartedly accepted by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon her. So this is important to realize that it is a covenant and is a very serious subject in a very serious time is coming this is going to be a worldwide event everybody around the world is going to see this coronation people are going to accept him as their king and maybe even the world leader the king the beast that's put in charge that speaks at the WEF and has the net zero that his royal cipher, his personal mark, wants to get down to the 666 of carbon, net zero, which is cipher. And that would be the mark of the king, the mark of the beast. So I'm trying to clarify this in your mind so that you begin to have it sink in that this is what's really coming to pass and this is what it means in Revelation. So when the king is anointed and Israel sets the king as their leader upon their throne, he makes an oath, he makes a covenant in the coronation ceremony. And we know that things are kind of lining up. We have the coronation coming. Then we have Israel's birthday. Then we have Shavuot. Before all of that, just before the king's coronation, is coming the second Passover, Pesach Shani, which is supposed to be May 4th and 5th. And then the king is crowned on May 6th. Israel's birthday is May 14th and Shavuot in Israel is May 25th. 
So all of that is like boom, 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 ducks in a row. And it'll be very interesting. You got to keep your eyes open for what's about to happen. This is going to be a, an extraordinary once in a lifetime event that the world is going to see. Not since 1953 was there this type of coronation ceremony in Britain. Now in order to understand that Britain has a history in Jerusalem, I want to read this to you, which is called the Mandate Years, Colonialism and the Creation of Israel. And this is about Charles Glass reappraises British rule in Palestine and a century of Zionism in this exclusive online essay. It says the British Army occupied Jerusalem on Sunday, December 9th, 1917, and withdrew on May 14th, 1948. During its brief imperium in the Promised Land, Britain kept the promise made in 1917 by its Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, in the declaration that bears his name to favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. While nurturing the national home, a term as deliberately vague as Palestinian autonomy is today, Britain neglected to observe the Declaration's final clause, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Britain erected and for 30 years maintained the scaffolding that the Zionists happily tore down when their House of Israel was ready. Despite the objections of some British military commanders and civil servants in Palestine, His Majesty government protected Jewish immigration, encouraged Jewish settlement, subsidized Jewish defense, and protected the Yeshub, as Palestine's minority Jewish community called itself, from the native population. Without Great Britain, there would not have been an Israel for the Yeshuv or a catastrophe, or as they say in Arabic, Nakba, for Palestine's Arab majority. And it's not surprising that each year Balfour Day is celebrated by the Friends of Israel and mourned by Palestinian Arabs. Israeli textbooks and propaganda novels such as Leon, Eurus Exodus have tended to portray the Zionist pioneers waging a war of independence against the British oppressor. John and David Kimchi provided a good example of the conventional Israeli analysis of British policy in both sides of the hill. Britain and Palestine War 1960, it was a mixture of ignorance, blundering, indecision, and local bias against the Jews, encouraged by the known bias of the foreign secretary. Now, what this is referring to is that there was a ship loaded with illegal Jewish immigrants from Europe that were seen on the ship called Exodus. And it was taken to Haifa port March 22, 1947. And it was released by the Israeli government press office and obtained by Reuters on June 18, 2018. An older generation of Israelis and Palestinians can still remember British soldiers patrolling the streets of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Ramallah during the three decades that Britain controlled the territory. British troops captured Jerusalem from the Ottoman Empire in 1917, and in 1922 the League of Nations awarded Britain an international mandate to administer Palestine during the post-war deal-making that redrew the map of the Middle East. The award of the mandate also endorsed the 1917 Balfour Declaration, in which Britain expressed support for a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. In 1948, exhausted by World War II and the strain of holding warring Jewish and Arab forces apart, the British withdrew. Seventy years later, Israelis and Palestinians who lived through the era remember it very differently. Under the British, 
the early Zionist movement was able to lay the groundwork for what would become modern Israel. Its parliament, laws, and military bear traces of British influence, as do many buildings and street names. So see that King Charles III would fit right in there. But Israelis also remember how Britain restricted the number of Jews fleeing to Palestine from Nazi-controlled Europe. Tens of thousands who tried to enter illegally by sea were taken to detention camps in Cyprus and Palestine. We loved the British, but their policy, when it was against us, sparked anger and rage that are understandable, said Shlomo Hillel, 95, a former Israeli diplomat and minister. Hillel's late wife, Susanna, fled Austria when the Nazis annexed it in 1938. After a year at sea, she was taken with her family to a British detention camp in Palestine where they were held for another year. Until this day, I do not understand it, Hillel said. Hillel went on to operate a secret underground munitions factory beneath a kibbutz near Tel Aviv that had been set up as a cover for their clandestine bullet-making operations. British soldiers would occasionally drop by at the kibbutz for routine visits. He hosted them with beer and sandwiches, but to avoid future surprise visits, he served them undrinkably warm beer one summer day, telling them that if they gave him advance notice, I can prepare the beer and keep it in the fridge. After that, he always knew when the British were coming. Smart man. Ram Haviv, 93, a retired Israeli senior civil servant, served in the British Army in Iraq, Egypt, and Iran in World War II. The relationship wasn't too favorable on the part of the British government of the time, but we'd rather now remember the positive aspects for which we are just the same thankful. After the Second World War, the State of Israel was founded on the cornerstones of the British rule in Palestine. So you see, this history gives King Charles III a historical aspect to where the Jews could definitely claim him and vote him in as their king upon David's throne. Now this is important. It says, Britain gave our land to the Jews. Sitting under an apple tree in Dar Jarir village in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, blah, 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 Abdel Fattah Shijaya mostly remembers the British as an unwelcome military presence who imprisoned his father and issued a death warrant on his brother for their involvement in an Arab uprising in the 1930s. Shijaya, 96, had joined the police under the British because of the state of poverty. There was no money and my father was in jail, he said. His brother was never caught and was later pardoned, and he himself later took up arms in the 1940s as Arab feelings hardened against the British and the growing numbers of Jewish immigrants. We are convinced Britain gave our land to the Jews. So you see how if they put King Charles III in place as their king, then he could do this again. It could give this land to the Jews. I believe that there will be a piece of land, the Temple Mount, you know, that land lease for a seven-year period of time, and he will start the, the sacrificial system by being the anointed one that performs the red heifer ceremony, the blood covenant, with many, that he sprinkles the blood on many, uh, the ashes of the red heifer is what I'm saying. And they're considered purified to begin the temple service. So he would allow the third temple to be built. It says, in dusty archives in Gaza, old British land records are still in use. I just think this is amazing because the Lord had revealed that about Letith and Let being a land lease. Having to do with giving the parcel of land to the Jews to be able to build the third temple and allowing them to either rent it or you know lease it out so 
The yellowing pages are stamped with the mandate era name Palestine government. The listed proprietor for some districts is recorded as the High Commissioner for the time being in trust for the government of Palestine. In Khan Yunus refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, Ahmed Jargoon, 75, displayed a document for a piece of land that he says his father bought and registered with the British authorities in 1944. The land lies on the other side of the Gaza-Israel border in what's now the Israeli city of Lod. I want my land back, he says. We as Palestinians want our country back. Balfour gave what he did not own to those who were undeserving. Okay, so the British, they were giving the land to the Jews. And what's going to happen when they put this king, this final king, as their monarch on that throne, on the throne of David, a last earthly king? And he is the one performing the ceremony of the red heifer and allows the third temple to be built, the blood covenant with the uh, sprinkling and purification of the people to start performing the third temple sacrifice system all over again. And implementing laws, changing times and laws. So we can clearly see how Britain had a major part in the establishment of the land of Israel. And once again, we'll have something to do with the end times in the book of Revelation, as I've laid out in numerous videos. So I hope you found all of this information interesting, and uh, I'm just trying to open people's eyes to the fact that they did have a major inroad, and they controlled Jerusalem for that number of years that I talked about from 1917 to 1948. So what's to prevent these kind of land deals in the near future. So as soon as they see this king as the anointed one, um, and he changes the coronation oath to be removing or shifting just the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you've got the ultra-Orthodox over there that want to that are members of the Sanhedrin that want to be the world supreme court if they put this king on the throne they're going to be demanding that the king implement some of these new laws that they want passed which means the removal of the gospel and something is going to happen but we won't be here we've already got our king and we're going up and we're going to meet him in the air, in the glory cloud. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And this is very important information to let you know what's really, you know, this is what I'm processing that the Holy Spirit is revealing to me. And I'm just putting pieces of this puzzle together to show you that Britain had a major, major connection with the development of the land of Israel with the British mandate. May the Lord soon come quickly. Maranatha. Amen.